You and I are talking and you say to me, hey, Brene, I know you really well. And I think I know your heart. And what you just said felt really hurtful and racist. If you said that to me, the first thing I experience is shame. But, but let me say this for everybody, people in the back especially, feeling shame when we're held accountable for racism is not the same thing as being shamed for being a racist. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to The New Normal. I'm Kay Wright, your Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, and let me tell you about our guest today, Dr. Brene Brown. She is a research professor at the University of Houston, visiting professor at the University of Texas. She spent the last two decades studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. She's the author of Five, count them, one, two, three, four, five, number one New York Times bestseller to include her most recent one, Dare to Lead. Dr. Brown, welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Brene, please. Brene, all right. Yeah. So, hey, thanks again uh, for joining us. So many of our airmen will be so excited to to see you here. Uh, There are such big, we all are such big fans of yours. So, again, we just want to say thank you for the great work that you've been doing um, in this in this space. Hey, I'm interested. Thank you and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, then say thank you. And um, it's been an honor to be able to work with the U.S. Air Force across a lot of different areas. Um, I'm a big fan, so it's mutual. Yeah, thank you. Interesting last couple of months and certainly an interesting last couple of weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued on uh, what concerns you more, COVID-19 or... Uh, the race issues that we're dealing with as a country? Um, I'm trying, for sure, the race issues. um, I think they are, even from a public health lens, a much greater threat to our physical well-being, our emotional and mental well-being than COVID. And I think one of the things that anytime there's a crisis, even if it's like, let's just take a, let's take a family or a unit, anytime there's a crisis, the cracks and fault lines of that family or that unit are are brought to light. Um, So let's say you have a health issue in a family. Um, If you've got a marriage that's almost crumbling, there's the stress on that starts to happen. If you've got a kid in stress, that, that un folds. So I think what COVID has done is it has made clear the, even before, even before the, the protest started, it made, it made very clear the racial disparities in this country. Um, You know, when COVID started, I remember people saying, this is, this is the big equalizer, you know, like um, COVID is COVID does not discriminate. Mm. And I, I remember thinking to myself, no, COVID doesn't discriminate, but Americans discriminate. And so we're going to find very quickly that the people most susceptible are the people who have been the most susceptible to, um, whose lives are most impacted systemically by the white supremacy. And I think that's exactly what we saw. Yeah. Um Many people cringe when they hear that word, white supremacy, um, white privilege. Why, why is it so difficult for people, specifically white people, to talk about racism? Uh, it, it's interesting because I think it's, it's hard for us because of cognitive dis well you, i think that it, there's there's a lot of reasons because just like black people are not a monolith or one group white people are not one group but i think for a lot of us who believe ourselves to be not racist um we don't understand we don't understand that it's in our bones we don't understand that it's the fabric of it's it's everything we saw on television growing up, every message we received. I just did an interview with Ibram Kendi, who is a scholar who studies anti-racism. And he has this incredible metaphor. He said, from the day you're born in this country, 
race, racism and racist ideas are just pouring down on your head and you're just sopping wet with them. But the nature of racism is it, it tells you you're not even wet. So when someone hands you an umbrella and says, hey, you're actually soaking wet with these ideas, here's an umbrella. The best thing to do is say, thank you for the umbrella, I had no idea, but we feel cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is how can I be thinking or feeling something embedded in me that is unjust and unkind when I consider myself a kind and just person? And that feeling, you know, how you you say I'm privileged, you have no idea what I'm I come from. You know, you have no idea what I've been up against. I have no privilege. But privilege doesn't mean that you didn't work your ass off. Mm -hmm. Privilege doesn't mean that it wasn't hard for you. White privilege means you didn't have to work harder and you it wasn't hard for you because you were white. That, I mean, it doesn't mean you didn't work hard. I mean, no one would ever be able to take away from me the fact that I worked my way through college, that I, you know, that these things were, you know, but that's not what that is. So I think reason, the reason people have a hard reaction to it is we, we have a hard time reconciling that we could be promoting racist systems, but still be good people. And that's just, that's true. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. One of the one of the things that we've uh, General Goldfein and myself have encouraged people to do since since the George Floyd incident, and we kind of simultaneously yeah. had our own race race issue in the Air Force with some disparity and in, injustice in for uh, young yeah. black. And one of the things that we've encouraged people to do is commanders and leaders is to hey just talk just just talk to people and have open and honest conversations. And they come back and say, we, I don't, we don't know how to talk about it. I don't, I don't know, you know, what to do. So from an action standpoint, what, what would you encourage them? Uh, because some people are saying, hey, we need training. And, but these discussions need to happen now. What, what advice would you give to, to them for, um, for talking about race, racism, specifically with the Black Airmen that may be in their formations? I... You know what? It's really interesting because it's it's an interesting time for you to ask this because we we have these certified dare to lead and, and daring way facilitators. And we just put we said we said we have to start having these conversations. And a lot of people are like <laughs> and and so here's what's interesting. In order to have these conversations, you don't need to be a subject matter expert. So, so, so when we talk about training, we talk about subject matter expertise and then facilitation skills. We, we don't need to be subject matter experts, but we do need to be committed facilitators of the conversation, which means hold space for multiple experiences, invite the conversation in, be vulnerable, be a learner, not a knower. Um, and this is not this is not easy in the Air Force, because with leadership becomes an idea sometimes in the military that I have to be the knower. That what makes me a leader is having the answers. You know, I'm a leader in the Air Force because I can hold space for hard conversation, but that's not part of the basic training, I don't think. But I do think you do need to offer these folks who are gonna have the conversations subject matter expertise that and shared. So let's all, what we'd like for all of our commanders to do is sit down for an hour and listen to this podcast or listen to this person talk. And then I, all you need to do is facilitate a conversation and make sure people feel safe speaking. They should be able to do that as their job as a leader. But I, I think we have to be careful saying, hey, we got a lot of hard race stuff going on, go have a conversation because they don't have the subject matter expertise and they could end up hurting people, especially people of color. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, speaking of subject matter expertise, so uh, I don't think anyone would argue that you're the subject matter expert on vulnerability, on shame. <clears throat> and it, 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 it reminds me, it kind of came to me that in order for 
people to have these uncom uncomfortable conversations, I think they have to enter into a space where they could potentially be vulnerable because typically as leaders, as commanders and command teams, you know, we're in a position where we know it all, we like to control it all, but, but here's an area where I think we have to be okay with a little bit of vulnerability, right? No, uh, you got to be okay with a whole bunch of vulnerability. Like these are the most, these are the most vulnerable of vulnerable conversations. So two things that happen. So you said vulnerability and shame. One, you can't, brave leaders, the bravest leaders are never quiet about hard things. And so that means brave leaders have to be open to be being vulnerable, right? The second thing is when you ask like, why do people cringe when they hear, where, well, specifically, let's just keep it frank, right? Why do white people cringe when they hear the term white privilege or white supremacy? That's a shame issue because I, you and I are talking and you say to me, hey, Brene, I know you really well. And I think I know your heart and what you just said felt really hurtful and racist. If you said that to me, the first thing I experience is shame. But, but let me say this for everybody, people in the back especially, feeling shame when we're held accountable for racism is not the same thing as being shamed for being a racist. Mm. If I, yeah, if I feel shame because you hold me accountable I need to work through that on my own because what ends up happening is, okay, let's just play it out. So let's say, let's say I say something to you and you come back and say, man, Brene, that, that feels kind of racist. Why don't you say that to me? Man, Brene, that, that feels kind of racist. Um, so I'm totally not a racist. I'm a really good person. I have a lot of black friends. Um, I love black music and I, and um, you know, like, no, I'm not a, are you calling me a, like, I'm not a racist. I'm a, I, you know me, man, like, I'm a good person. Um, and so what happens there, I wish y'all could see him on this podcast because he's laughing really hard. He's doing the quiet, really hard laugh. Um, he's still laughing. No, now he's, now he's making the audible laughing sounds. Um, does that, is that what happens or not? That's exactly what happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what that is, is I feel shame. And I'm double downing. Yeah, I'm doubling down on, hey, I'm a good person. But the thing is, your niceness and your kindness doesn't make you an anti-racist. So when we're in these hard conversations, okay, let me tell you something. I have taught race, class, and gender for 20 years. Hmm. I am still called out on my privileged spots. I am still called out when I say things that are like, man, you are really in your whiteness right now. That's, that's a great theory, but that's a white girl's theory right there because that is not my experience. In those moments, I have to put my, this is, what, this is what I'll share my private mantra with you. My private mantra to stay out of shame is I am not here to be right. I am here to get it right. I am not here to be right. I am here to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm held account, because there is Two things there. One, again, I learned from Ibram Kendi and Austin Channing Brown, two great resources for your leaders to play podcasts or just clips and like, let's just talk about this five minute clip as a group. Um, you're either racist or anti-racist. There is no middle ground of, now I don't know about Black Lives Matter and that stuff, but I know I'm not racist. No, you're either anti-racist or racist. That's it. And if you're like me, you grew up with messages, systems. I mean, one of the things that's been real for me is I could never say, look, I don't believe you about your black name keeping you out of getting jobs. I can't, I, I can't say that because my name's Brene Brown. And so I can't tell you the number of interviews I've gotten to where people go, you're white. And I go, yeah. And they're like, oh my God, we're kind of relieved because we, we weren't sure. And I'm like, oh, you're an asshole. Okay. So no need to do the interview. Um, so that stuff is real. That's real. 
You know, you've got a guy, a bird watcher in New York, in Central Park. Mm -hmm. And then a white woman who's not afraid of him at all, of this tall black man, you know, strapped with guns, no, strapped with binoculars and bird watching equipment. Um, and he, you know, she's not afraid of him at all. He says, please put your dog on a leash, which is the law in Central Park, and it scares the birds, and he's birding. And she said, leave me alone. In not a scared voice, leave me alone or I'll call the police on you. And he's like, call the police for what? You're not supposed to have your dog off the leash. And then the minute she gets on the phone, she does the performative quiver. There's, there's a black man and he's threatening. What white people don't, I think, understand is that there is a 10 second walk from that experience to George Floyd. There's no space in between that behavior and what happened to George Floyd. Hmm. It's people using whiteness to exert power. It's people controlling and patrolling blackness at every level. Mm -hmm. And so Austin Channing Brown, I mean, these are two podcasts I just have done in the last two weeks. They would be a great resource for people to talk about just because it would give them common language to say, I didn't understand this part, I disagree with this part. But Austin Channing Brown says that the true, at the heart of anti-racism work is just becoming a better human to other humans. Yeah, you know, I saw that, uh, so I was, I was checking you out. I actually started following both of them uh, based on your Instagram. And uh, I saw when she said that, and that's, that's uh, I, was, I was pleasantly, uh, please, because that's been a, a bit of a mantra of mine in trying to solve some of the Air Force's problems is, hey, sometimes we just got to be better human beings. And uh, so I'm glad to see that it applies to, to that as well. Yeah. And when someone says to you, hey, I want to give you some feedback that's going to let you be a better human being. Yeah. The answer to that is not, oh, I have a black friend. The answer to that is, thank you. I'll take it. Yeah. Hey, does this feel different to you? So we, you know, we've been here before, right? Rodney King. Yeah. Eric yeah. Brown, this, we've, we've had protests and, and, and these uprisings. Does this, does this one feel different to you? Does it feel like we might make some real progress this time? Now, you know, I, you know, I, I want to believe that I, it does feel different. Um, one of the markers that I have about difference is this time is I guess Braving the Wilderness, that book came out in maybe 2017. I don't remember. But in that book, I write about my support for Black Lives Matter. And it was very, it was super controversial. A lot of readers were like, no, we're out. Um, and then people actually walked out of my book tour talks. Some of them did when I talked about supporting CAP in the NFL, Kaepernick supporting Black Lives Matter. And now the same people that were like, why did you do that in that book? People that I know have Black Lives Matter signs in their front yard. And so like, and so, and I, I just do think, you know, th there's, there's, there's a lot has, that has been done around this from comedy routines to activism, but it, Black Lives Matter is a pretty low bar. Like, like, you know, um, but, I'm just saying the same matter, like right. It's a, the black lives are glorious, dignified, holy, wonderful, you know. Um, so I think in some ways there's definitely a critical mass of mainstream media of mainstream America that gets it now. Is it gonna be enough to propel people to show up and vote? Because the heart changing hearts and minds is great, but it has nothing to do with making black lives safer in my mind. Yeah. So I, I it feels different to what? me. I, I, I like that there's been some changes, you know, the Confederate flag for, from yeah. military bases from NASCAR and, and some of those other things. But, but I don't think the, the real change occurs when, when there's a significant change and we root out some of the, the racism and, the economic systems and in the housing and in public schools. And then that's right. That, that's because that's the real driver behind a lot of this. So I, I am optim, I'm hopeful 
and I feel good about where we are and I feel good about um, the amount of people that are uh, trying much trying much harder to empathize and understand what's going on in this country uh, but what we really need is and, and a lot of that like you mentioned it starts at the ballot uh, but we really need to in order to see significant change uh, economic systems banking schools uh, those are the things that will really change the nature of racism in this in this country yeah criminal justice system like like yeah it's got there's got to be and you know what i would what, what i try to tell my what i've told my kids and what steve and i my husband and i talk about all the time in my team um you know because i lead 30 people um is make no mistake that we're in a fight you know, we're, we're in a fight. Um, it's, we, growing up, I remember reading about moments in history, whether it was how we treated Native Americans or the Jewish genocide of the Holocaust, or, and I remember thinking, how did people let that happen? And we are the people right now, and it is happening. And we are in the middle of history right now. Like it is, we are in a fight for <clears throat> the dignity of human beings and, and not just black human beings, but our own, Yeah. you know, we, you know, we're actually in two fights because even though the last two weeks have been pushed to the forefront. What we still have in the background is, uh, is COVID-19 and these, these cases that, that are yeah. really in many places increasing, I think increasing in most places except, uh, ironically, New, New York. Um, how, how have you been dealing with COVID? Uh, you know, how has this changed your battle rhythm and, and how you operate and, and the things that you've been doing? What impact has COVID-19 had on, on you? A huge, I mean, just huge, just absolutely, um, you know, it's changed everything. It's changed the way we work. I mean, we, in the, in the first week of COVID, COVID, we lost 80% of our revenue sources as a company for the year, because, you know, I speak, I do book, I tour, I do, you know, those kind of things, but there was none of that. And, I'm married to a physician, so, you know, it's, it's, it's 360 impact, you know, and, and we got my sisters and I and my husband got my mom out of, a, out of um, her assisted living facility like an hour before it shut down. So she was quarantined with us for 12 weeks. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, it's interesting. I think about the Air Force a lot when I think about COVID, and I'll tell you why. Uh -oh. Yeah, I do. I think about the military in general, but I've thought just because I've done so much work with the Air Force over the last couple of years, um, that's kind of my frame of reference right now. Um, my friends at West Point would be like, excuse me, um, but, <laughs> but it is the Air Force is really kind of my frame of reference. But readiness, like you don't get the Air Force ready when there's a problem mm. you know and and the problem the definition of the problem decreases based on readiness and so I if there's anything that I think I hope we've learned is that um, pandemic readiness this was not a surprise to the people who dedicated their careers to studying this this is not a surprise you know this is not a surprise and this is not a surprise. Right. And our lack of readiness for this is nothing, is not anything we would accept from the military. It's nothing we would expect from you know, education. And so if anything, I hope you've learned that whether we wanna be connected to the globe or not, no matter where you fall on that political debate about globalization, what happens in China matters here. What goes down in, you know, Sydney, Australia affects us. Like we are inner, you know, inextricably connected to each other. And this is not going to be the last pandemic.
Yeah. Well, I, I saw an interview you recently did where you talked about the challenges of uh, you and uh, Stephen being being home together. Um, yeah. Jesus. That's one of the challenges that some of our airmen are facing. Now, we're starting to get back to somewhat normalcy, but we still have yeah. some folks who are working. Uh, how have you dealt with um, being home together, still trying to get work done, uh, potentially homeschooling? Uh, oh, yeah. what, what, actually, what advice would you have for folks who might have lacked the readiness, who might not have been prepared for this type of pandemic and, and how to just maintain a normal life uh, in this, what we consider the new norm. Well, I have, we have this system in our family that we, Steve and I have this system because we've been, to, we just celebrated our 26th wedding anniversary together for 33 years. Yeah. And I will say the pandemic has been, you know, in that in that kind of stretch, there are hard, hard seasons. There are great seasons. There are season, you know, there's every kind of season you can imagine. This has been a hard season. Um, because we're both under so much stress, but we have this, this interesting system and I, and I would really recommend it for your folks because it helps. So before COVID, probably 10 years ago, I would come home from traveling and Steve was here holding down, you know, the fort and I'd open the back door and come in. He's like, Oh my God, I'm glad you're here. Cause I'm exhausted. You know? And I'm like, Oh no, no, no. I've been out working. Like, I'm glad I'm, I'm going to sleep because no, 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 I'm going to sleep. So we started this thing where I would come home and say, look, dude, I have 20% right now. I'm on 20. And he's like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I got your back. I, I'll, I'll cover you and I'll come up with 80. Or he'll come home and he'll say, I've got 10. I'm like, I'll cover you. I got 90. Because people say that a good relationship is 50-50 and that's total BS. It's never 50-50. Uh, a good relationship is when they can cover your 10 with their 90 and expect the same when they, you know. But what we, ha what we saw in the pandemic is I would say, look, Steve, look, I've got 10 right now. And he's like, dude, I've got 10 too. I'm like, well, what are we gonna, that's, we have a gapping 80% as functioning parents and adults. So we just came up with like rules of engagement when we could not come up with 100%, which is let stuff slide, forgive more often, be kind, don't talk about each other's families. You know, like, I mean, like we had, like just rules of engagement when we could not come up with a hundred. And the problem is the system was great, but even that system mm -hmm. cracked under the pandemic because you can't ride on, on 10, 10 for very long, but we, we did. And it was just one of those things where we would get to a place where like, I'm going to watch TV upstairs. I need you to watch TV downstairs. Then I'm going to sleep upstairs and I need you to sleep downstairs. Like mm -hmm. just, just, reality check the expectations like it was funny because when i would i did some work on air force base for y'all i guess last year year before last and i was and i just remember because whatever whenever it was everybody had a mustache it looked terrible um, <laughs> but they did it. Yeah. yes yes <laughs> um and there was a retired air force guy on the flight behind us and um he, he kept saying, he kept saying something that I picked up because he kept saying on time, on target, on time, on target. Um, and I remember during like COVID probably about a month ago. Um, and then when I got home, I started saying that, I'm like, come on kids, let's go. We need to be on time, on target. And she's like, you're not going to work with the Air Force anymore because you come home saying the craziest stuff. Um, <laughs> Because even I picked up something where I was cleaning up the kitchen and I was like, hey, if you're not maintenance, you ain't shit. And she's like, what? And I was like, oh, sorry. Like, I, I just had all these Air Force things in my head that I couldn't. Um, uh, yeah. and, if you and ain't, so, um, it's, it's actually, if you ain't ammo, but it's kind of, yeah, yeah. That, I don't think that's what these guys were saying. Oh, really? <laughs> no. No, in fact, when I asked them about it, they said, oh, everything can be perfect. You want to do without us? You want to do this without us for five minutes? I was like, no, no, I do not. No, sorry, I don't. <laughs> um, but, um, but Steve and I just sat down and we just said, he said, you know, you're saying on time, on target. I was like, yeah, and he goes, nothing's going to be on time and nothing's going to be on target in our house. In our jobs, we have to do that. But here, nothing's going to be 
as precise as it is when we're not in this. So we just had to let stuff go. Yeah. And you, you also mentioned during that, that, uh, that time that you said it's okay to feel, to feel whether it's grief or what have you, because I think you were referring to uh, folks feeling guilty about feeling grief or feeling shame or feeling bad or whatnot. Uh, can you expound a little bit on your, your thoughts about for those of us who are going through this and, try, and trying to meet the challenges and working from home and dealing with this new normal, uh, that it's okay to feel, feel what, what should we be feeling? I think the point is you can feel anything you want. And I think one of the things that people do is they say things like, how can I feel bad for my circumstance? when there are people dying of COVID in the hospital? How can I feel bad when, you know, and I call it comparative suffering. And it's this idea that we're not allowed to feel grief or disappointment or fear because people have it worse than us. And comparative suffering is rampant in the military. You know, like, how can how can I wake up today and feel down and sad and grieving for my life before COVID? It's not like I'm trying to touch a dying person through the, you know, through a little plexiglass because, you know, people, but the thing is this idea that we can't all own our feelings is super dangerous. And let me tell you, let me explain why. So Ellen, my daughter is I have a 20 year old, she just turned 21 yesterday, the 21 year old and a soon to be 15 year old. My eighth grade, my eighth grade son is really sad because they're not gonna have his eighth grade party and his eighth grade graduation to high school. They're not gonna, he's an athlete. They're not gonna have the sports camp this summer. And you know, he's like, I'm really sad. I'm so frustrated, but I know mom, I'm sorry. I know people have it a lot worse than us, you know? And I'm like, hey, it's okay to feel those things and also keep in mind that people are having a hard time because when we feel shame about the emotions that we feel like we, we don't, we, we haven't, we don't have it hard enough to feel grief. Shame kills empathy. Mm. So when we feel shame about our emotions, it actually kills our ability to feel empathy for other people. Yeah. And so it's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to, let me tell you something. Like I did this, another podcast that I did with David Kessler on grief. He said, every single one of us right now is mourning the death of normal. I mean, it's your podcast. Like, because things will never be the same again. And I think that's true. Yeah. Wow. And to grieve that, you know, when Ellen came, Ellen had to leave college, I guess, in the middle of the semester and come home. And she said, I'm so sad. I miss my life. I miss my friends, my classes, my teacher, my work. And she's like, and I feel bad for crying. I said, grief is proportional to love. The fact that you're grieving tells me that you're building a life that you love and are proud of. I'm glad that you're grieving because if you didn't miss anything, I would question what kind of life you had built, you know? And so we, need to feel we need to feel and give ourselves permission to feel yeah no I, I, that's that's uh interesting that grief and sympathy can't oh shame and sympathy can't coexist right shame and shame and empathy empathy okay yeah, yeah. um like feeling because shame is super focused on yourself you're like oh my god I suck I'm terrible what will people think I wish the floor would swallow me up and so shame is super self-focused and empathy is other focused okay got it um so we 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 got the the racism issue we got COVID-19 and then for us as an air force I wonder if you can and can can help us and, and provide some thoughts on um suicide and resilience. So we still have this, even through through COVID, uh, we still have airmen that that uh, are dying by suicide, and we've dealt with this, you know, for man for so many years. We've averaged about a hundred suicides a year total total force, all of our airmen, civilians, guardsmen, reservists. But last year we had a significant increase, about a thirty around thirty percent increase in the number of airmen that that took their own lives. Um, 
man, what, what, what can or should we be doing? And I know this is a difficult and challenging question, but just off the top of your head, um, what, what can we be doing differently in terms of uh, suicide, suicide prevention, building resilience uh, in our- So I'll be, yeah, I'll be totally upfront that I don't have, this is not an area of expertise for me. Um, and there are people who have spent as much time studying the things I've studied, studying suicide and prevention. So I would let them speak to that specifically. What I would say is that just as a shame researcher, what I know is that we have to create environments that destigmatize mental health issues. Um, and I want to be careful because I know sometimes that we should be doing this and, you know, we, sh you know, I don't know those as well as people who study this. Um, but I do know that in environments where mental health, which is just emotions are seen as weakness, much less mental health issues are seen as weakness. Um, those, issues, the, those environments become very susceptible to suicide. And so I think what I, can, what I can contribute to the conversation is we have to stop seeing vulnerability as weakness. Yeah. You know, and, and that starts with the leadership in the Air Force. We have to stop seeing vulnerability as weakness. We have to have people like you that people look up to being honest about these conversations, being honest about how difficult it is. You know, we have to see vulnerability in leadership and we have to see leaders creating safe, psychologically safe environments for people to come forward. Because, you know, for commanders and people that one day, you know, have all these folks reporting to them and they're dealing with all of a sudden domestic violence, they're dealing with addiction, they're dealing with suicide, suicidal thoughts, you know, and they, the message is be strong and be tough, but never be vulnerable. That's just, that's just wrong. There is no strong and tough without vulnerability. Yeah. No, that's, that's actually really, really good advice. And, and, and one of the things that we've been working on as an Air Force is destigmatizing, making it uh, uh, normalizing uh, being vulnerable for commanders by, by having commanders and leaders at all levels by, by having us uh, sit down and discuss openly our issues, by having us you know, openly talk about and admit to uh, seeking out counseling and, and all yeah. that. I think that's a really, really good point about vulnerability. Hey, I want to tell you about when you, um, <clears throat> so I knew who you were. Uh, someone had passed me your book a couple of, maybe three years ago uh, and asked me to read it. And I thought, wow, she knows a lot about the Air Force. I think you were doing some work at, at uh, Barksdale with Colonel Halfhill. Um, but you know, let me tell you when you became my, my hero at uh, the National Character Leadership Symposium two years ago when you spoke and you talked about critics and you, you recited what's become one of my favorite uh, speeches, at least the portion that we know as the man in the arena. Um, tell us about you know, how you discovered the man in the arena and how you subsequently, because you have a very public life. I was, I was, I was intrigued to find out that you are an introvert, but yeah. uh, you have this very public life. You do a lot of speaking, and I'm certain, uh, like most of us who, who live in that space you have a lot of critics tell us about the man in the arena and how you've chosen to deal with your critics so uh, yeah i i it was in, it was a, it's actually a weird story so i um i had done this ted talk in houston a tedx houston talk on vulnerability and i didn't realize it was being taped um filmed and so I thought, it, so I was doing an experiment where I was going to try to be vulnerable while talking about vulnerability and vulnerability is not easy. I'm a fifth generation Texan. Literally our family motto is lock and load. Like we have it on stuff. Like, and so we, I was definitely raised to believe that vulnerability is, is weakness. Um, and so I did this Ted talk. I was super vulnerable. I shared about going to therapy. I shared, well, it was filmed and 
when it when they called and said they were going to put it up on the TED website, I was like, no, 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 that'll be the death of my career. No, and they're like, you know, walk your talk, right? You told us to be vulnerable, and you know, and so they put it up, and it had it got millions of viewers very quickly, and ended up being one of the most watched TED talks in the world. Like it's just been, it's I think it's at sixty million or something right now. It's it's awful. I've never seen it, but they tell me. Um, so right away, I started getting a lot of comments and, and a lot were like, oh, saying this, it was brave and it was good. Um, or yeah, that, that makes kind of sense. But some of them were awful, like awful. Like, you know, less research, more Botox. Um, you're what's wrong with the world. Someone should take her out. Like just stuff that I was not prepared for at all. And so one day I just covered myself in a blanket put on my whoobies, pajamas, and just watch Downtown, Downtown Abbey all day, like eight hours of it. And at the end of it, I was like, oh my God, I don't want to go back to my life in Houston. I just want to stay on this English countryside and pretend like this is not happening because every time I open my computer, it's like I'm bombarded. And so I got out my laptop and I was Googling Downtown Abbey. And I was like, was that like, who was president of the United States in Downtown Abbey? So I put, I literally put Theodore Roosevelt 1910 to see if he was president and this speech that he gave in that period of time came up and I was like that's interesting and there was a passage this was back when do you remember when Google used to cache like and give you highlighted things mm -hmm. well it highlighted this one portion and I read it and it said it's not the critic who counts it's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done it better the credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again and again, and who in the end may know the triumph, the triumph of high achievement. At least when he fails, he does so daring greatly. Yeah. And I was like, in that moment, I just said, three things became very clear. One, that that speech, that piece of that speech is everything I've ever known about vulnerability. That vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up when you can't control the outcome. Mm. Number two, I'm gonna be brave with my life. And we, we, just, we just crossed last year 400,000 pieces of data. I've never met a single person in my life who is courageous, who hasn't had their ass kicked and who has not fallen, who doesn't know failure and defeat, and I'm gonna be brave with my life. And then the third thing was, and this has been somewhat controversial, but very helpful for me, which is if you're not in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback about my work. There are too many cheap seats. Yeah, bravo, yeah. bravo. <laughs> <laughs> there's just too many, there's too many, and especially right now, with COVID, there's just too many cheap seats with people who will never be brave, but just sit back in those cheap seats, you know, and suck down their beer and eat their peanuts and hurl, you know, criticism and advice and judgment while never once stepping in. Like, if I'm going to take your, I'm only going to take the advice and feedback from people who know what it's like to be brave. Yeah. And to know it's scary because they're more careful with their feedback. Man, well, you certainly are and have been in the arena uh, representing just with the, this race issue, but with COVID and so many other issues that, um, you know, shame and vulnerability and, and all the other things. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of the United States Air Force and, and all of our airmen. Uh, I want to say thank you so much uh, for being in the arena for getting your ass kicked and showing us you know, how to be brave and, and how to do it. Uh, and I know you have a <clears throat> busy schedule, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, any parting words for our audience? Yeah, I mean, first is thank you for having me on. Thank you for, thank you for being in the, talking about being in the arena. Talk, um, thank you for having these conversations um, knowing that they're going to be a mixed bag for people, um, but having them anyway. And, and thank you for being the arena. And, you know, I guess just like you asked, is it going to be different this time? I really, from outside, see the Air Force at a precipice. Like I see 
critical mass of courage coming. Um, and I hope, I hope that happens because you just deserve the good stuff because courage is born of vulnerability. Trust is born of vulnerability, but so is love and so is belonging and so is intimacy. And so are all the other things that all the people that serve deserve. Um, and so I'm here to support and help any way I can, but I just think the work you're doing is really brave. Yeah. Thank you. you you've helped and, and supported us more than you can ever imagine. So thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been your new normal. I'm Kay Wright, and our special guest today was Brene Brown. So thank you, Brene, and uh, best of luck to each of you out there as we all cope with our new normal. Thanks.